everybody, and welcome to another edition of Knocked Conscious. I do want to put a slight disclaimer on this before we begin. Uh, we are going to be talking about a very sensitive subject. Uh, the subject is suicide. If you do feel uncomfortable, if you feel like there's something that you don't wouldn't want to hear about this podcast, I'd ask that you either listen to it with a friend or possibly avoid listening to it altogether because it is a very sensitive subject. Today, who's joining me? Tony from MJ News Digest. He's across the pond in Europe, in England, in the UK. Tony, how are you doing out there? I'm doing really well, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I've I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, so thank you for bringing this topic to our attention. And thank you for inviting me back. It was a real honor uh, to be invited Absolutely. the first time. So yeah, this is a sequel. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Absolutely. Before we continue, and we don't have to do it here, we can always do it later, but you said a couple things on the last podcast that kind of came to fruition in the UK. Did you want to just say I told you so or anything before we <laughs> move forward, forward? About COVID and the uh, the passports? Yes. The, uh, yeah. So yeah, that, that's that's a thing in the UK now. So if we want to go to uh, if we want, if we want to go to a pub or if we want to go to certain sporting events or concerts, we have to have our vaccination passport and prove that we've been vaccinated before we can enjoy ourselves. Isn't that fun? My mom and my dad are seventy seven, and my dad's about to turn eighty one this year. Wow! They are pretty much they were anti vaxxers until this decree came out. My parents are so afraid that they are going to shut it down for travel and flight that they just got the vaccination. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, if my parents can be scared into it, you know what I mean? Or convinced, whatever the term is, you know, strong armed. I don't know what the correct term is. But but surely vaccination should the incentive should should just be to be vaccinated. It shouldn't be. Yeah. There shouldn't be any other in incentive. I agree. I agree. So uh, we had your I told you so moment. Thank so, you. <laughs> Thanks. Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we we say a lot of bold things on our show, too, and. A lot of it's not right or anything, but it's these are opinions. And when they do come true, hey, it's great to to call your shot, you know? Exactly. So we're going to talk about some serious stuff today. Um, we are going to make this a two-parter, Tony, as we had talked. We're going, this part's going to be more about the uh, science behind the numbers, the data, the information, how to detect it, all that, all that stuff. And then we're going to kind of have a very personal story or share a personal stories. And we're going to broadcast that a week later. Okay. Um, but if you do have a couple stories that you can sprinkle in here, I do have a couple stories to sprinkle in this episode. Um, okay. But uh, you know, feel free, however you're at your discretion. I know you have a few stories and I have one that that will be a long one as well. And I also have a couple of emails from listeners as well on, on the topic of suicide. So it'd be great to, to read those. That would be excellent as well. Yeah. So how did we want to start, sir, with the, some of these statistics? Yeah, so the World Health Organization say that one person in the world dies from suicide every 40 seconds. Uh, that was data, I think, from 2019. So I'd imagine that since the pandemic, that's probably increased. In America, suicide is a 10th leading cause of death, and that's for all ages. And there's one suicide death every 11 minutes in America. Wow. Uh, in the UK, the rate for females under 25 has actually increased by 93.8% since 2012. Uh, and the, the highest rate is still between men, uh, the ages between uh, 45 and 49, and that's increased since 2018. And there are 18 suicides a day in the UK. So it's, this is a, a conversation that definitely needs to be, to be had and to be heard. Right. And that's in the UK alone is 19 a day? 18, yeah, 18, 18 suicides oh, a day, yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and these are real things. I mean, it's, un, and it's, and has increased, right? We've, we've talked, we'll talk about social dilemma and how social media has affected it, and we'll talk about that. How would you like to break it out? Do you want to start with certain demographics? Um, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, there was an interesting article in, uh, what's it called nature nature human behavior and it was regarding the impact of the covid pandemic on suicide rates in japan um it was it's called increase in suicide following an initial decline during covid19 pandemic in japan yes um, i pulled that one i'm pulling that one up right now yeah and it talks about this uh, increase in concern that the coronavirus pandemic could harm psychological health and exacerbate uh, suicide risk but interestingly the first five months of the pandemic 
uh, in Japan, suicide risks actually declined by 14%. And that could be because perhaps government subsidies, uh, there were reduced working hours because of social distancing and, uh, and various measures put into place for COVID. But during the second wave, so between July and October 2020, the monthly suicide rates actually increased by 16%. And most of those, uh, the highest increase was for females, adolescents and children, uh, which is really alarming. Wow. What do you think about that? Why do, why do you think? The, so the I actually has... have a thought about that. When, okay. when the pandemic started and pe- we started working from home, I'm assuming you had the similar uh, overall protocol. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, I think a lot of people got to kind of tidy up their house a little bit in between time, between work. Yeah. So the first where the dip happened is kind of where people were very productive at home. And then I think after that, those home projects, chores got tidied up. Now that now you got inside your own head. Yeah, too much. And time. then it and then, you know, because you're kind of we're always constantly improving. Right. So when we have nothing else to improve, we start thinking about the, you know, the thought, the mental part of it becomes overwhelming. Hmm. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people had too much time to to think. And also being at home to begin with was great. But then, yeah. like you say, there's only so much you can do at home. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty, it's unbelievable, right? And I wonder if that's, like just going back to Japan, the increase during the second wave with the, with females and children and adolescents, could that be, could, I guess for like a traditional housewife, that's putting a lot more pressure. The fact that, you know, the whole family is at home, schools aren't open, your husband can't go to work or your wife can't go to work. Uh, so perhaps that's to do with the the pressures of of keeping your home going. Yeah, that too. I mean, have you ever taken a long trip with a with a you know a, a significant other? And like day six, day seven, you're like, yeah, I think we've been together pretty much yeah. just a, a minute too long. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I don't get that ever, Tony. Just so oh, you okay, know, because yeah, okay. because Megan listens. So okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, you know, I understand what you mean by that. By that, do you think there are any other contributing factors to this? to this like dip and then increase? Um, I think with the increase as well, I mean, for, for a while last year, I worked in uh, a mental health crisis service and I definitely saw an increase in uh, suicide, su- suicidal ideation and the pandemic. There was a lot of anxiety around the pandemic and that seemed to be fueled by the fear mongering, uh, you know, in the press. And I think it just took its toll on people. Yeah. Well, negativity does certainly work um, mm. as a tactic both in politics in commercials right like fear yeah, yeah. fear is a very it's probably the most powerful motivator for people to evoke action or to you know incite some kind of emotion right what was that really good documentary series um you, you and you and chris spoke about it once uh, i think you had a couple of episodes devoted to it, uh, it was yes i think was BBC. it the uh was it the BBC Self, one? Century of Century Self? of the Self. Yeah, yeah Century of the amazing. Self. It is an unbelievable. I, w- I wouldn't even recommend to listen to the podcast about it. I would recommend just watch the four hours of it. It's on BBC. It's on YouTube. It doesn't cost anything. It is the most interesting piece on how we've been manipulated in that way. And I would recommend you watch each episode and then listen to the the podcast that deals with that episode because it's like the bonus features it's great there you go thank thank you sir i appreciate <laughs> it right. oh, we're always plugging each other my friend <laughs> and and follow all the michael jackson news on mg news digest of course Thanks, man. um well thank you but um yeah to that point like i said i think it's it's funny because i think initially any kind of self-reflection is good and then it gets then it's too much right there's it's like balance like anything in in the world um we you, you work in the mental health profession. I've, uh, they just removed solitary confinement, I think, in the state of California or New York. And I'm not 100% sure which one. I think it might have been New York. Cuomo okay. may have removed it. And, and what they're finding is solitary confinement creates the schism, creates the break in your brain. That isolation of you with only yourself does not generally work very well for you. No, a lot of people aren't comfortable in their own skin or, or, or perhaps aren't comfortable spending time with themselves. Correct. Right. And then that gets exacerbated, right? Because yeah. when you don't feel good, you withdraw, but the withdrawing increases the feeling of not feeling well. Yeah. And it snowballs, right? 
Yeah, it's like a vicious circle, isn't it? It's pretty nasty. Mm. <laughs> pretty nasty. So, um, how do you want to move on to what? What are your thoughts? The final thoughts on this on the Japanese study? It's very interesting because what was it? What was the increase on that? Ninety three percent or? No, it was a sixteen percent increase. Sixteen um, percent in, during the second wave. Yeah, a fourteen percent decrease. Uh, but uh, females, yeah, an increase in females, adolescents, and children. Yeah. And that's where I feel like, uh, for us, if you notice like some of our themes, like all, children to me are, are victims in a lot of ways because they don't even know, you know, the, with the lack of consent, having who they don't get to choose their parents, right. They don't get to choose their, their, their environment. Yeah. It, it's tough. Yeah. And, uh, I've seen so many increases with the social media aspect of it. Right. Yeah. Um, and you can't touch on we, that with, with social dilemma. Yes, exactly. Would you like to, would you like, do you mind if we kind of transition a little bit to that? And then we'll talk about possibly, um, actually, how about this? Let's do this. Do you have a story of someone that you lost that you'd want to share, uh, with us and, and we'll, then we'll go into this and then I've, I'm happy to share a story as well. Yeah. So, uh, the first person I lost to suicide was a good friend called Mark. Um, we were childhood friends. I think we connected mostly because I had a, a traumatic childhood. He had a traumatic childhood and he was the only person that I kind of, you know, would talk about those kind of things to. Um, but unfortunately that followed him uh, throughout his young life. So in, in, in his twenties, he had real trouble uh, with relationships. Uh, he tended to get involved in relationships a little bit too much. Um, he, his girlfriend split up with him and he couldn't cope with it. And he hung himself from a flagpole on a beach and yeah, just absolutely devastating. That is awful. That's awful. And, and how do you mind if I ask when's the last time you spoke with him before that? Before um, did that? It was quite a while before that. It would have been a couple of years. And so of course there's guilt that, you know, had I, had I, had I continued to, to keep in touch with him, then perhaps that wouldn't have happened. But mm. uh, I think guilt is something that we all go through in terms of suicide. Yeah. Guilt drives a lot of mine as well. Yeah. And, and I'll share mine. Like I said, we're going to, we're going to have some deep, deep conversations about a couple of our stories. That's the one for sure. Okay. But you know, look, every things change. I mean, we don't have our high school friends, our childhood friends, and I know you know this, but the guilt yeah, is such a tough thing, right? It's so hard to let go. Yeah, I, I don't feel the guilt now. Uh, maybe that's maybe just because I've grown up or maybe my mental health training. But yeah, for, for a period of time, a lot of us felt really guilty. But as I said, that's a completely natural reaction to losing someone in that way. Yeah, and there's also survivor guilt. It's, it's yeah. even beyond losing that person, right? So, um, for example, I was in a pretty bad car accident and the person who drove the car pretty much walked away unscathed. Wow. And he... Uh, was definitely on kind of like a watch, right? Like a survival watch. Yeah. Cause I was in pretty bad shape. Yeah. So it, it's such a, such a big thing. And how long did it take him to, to resolve that survivor guilt? Well, I got, I mean, I, I only broke my femur. It just seemed really bad at the time. So, I mean, all, all in all, it wasn't as bad, but I, I don't think he ever got over it himself cause he, he knew better. <laughs> right. But you know, look, we all, we all, we're human. We make mistakes. It's not, he put that on himself a lot more than anyone put it on him, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and, and that's, that, that's how it works. Right. Hmm. But, well, thank you for sharing your story about Mark. Thank um, you. Are you in touch with anyone who knew Mark still? Uh, yeah. I, I, well, not now, but I was in touch with his brother for a while. Um, but yeah, I think it was just very hard for his brother. Uh, I know sometimes when people pass away, whether through suicide or, 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 or any other death, you know, family members want to connect with friends and uh, learn a little bit more about, you know, who they've lost. And that, that certainly happened uh, for a while. Yeah. It happened in my story as well. Uh, we had like okay. a beef and beer with his family, you know, after. Wow. So, yeah, I'll share. Obviously, like I said, we'll talk about that. Um, okay. Well, thank you again for sharing. I'm sorry for your loss. What, how long ago was that? Uh, oh, that would have been around 1992, 1991. Okay. So obviously people aren't talking at that point. I mean, that's such a taboo oh, yeah, thing to, yeah. to discuss. I mean, I mean still, it's still, I guess it's still taboo to, to a certain degree, but absolutely. The, the veil is definitely lifting, isn't it? Regarding suicide. We're definitely much more open, at least about our shortcomings. Right. I yeah. mean, that, and that's the thing is we need, we need to be able to, uh, 
to express our shortcomings without them actually being a negative thing that we have them. You know, exactly. It, it's just, it's just an accessory to our clothing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it's, it's my hair color. It's my, my, whether I have freckles or not, you know, it, it's just, it is part of who you are. Yeah. And multifaceted just... beings. <laughs> Extremely <laughs> multidimensional at times too. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Um, so going, going on to the social media, as we discussed, do you mind if I share these statistics off of that, that, yeah. uh, article yeah. I sent you from the sun? Yeah, go ahead. And what we'll do is I think, I think we'll just add all the links to the, to the header notes or to the liner notes as well, Tony, okay. yeah. so that everyone can look at this. Um, this is one of the most shocking things that I saw statistically, you know, statistically, um, with social media. So there's a documentary called the social dilemma. Chris and I did a, did an episode on the social dilemma. We did a deep dive, um, got some good response because we, we talked about some angles, you know, that other may, others may not have this number among young women, girls, I, I have to say girls, right? Tony, hmm. I mean, 10 to 14, I, I want to say young women, but <laughs> no girls, Very, yeah, girls, yeah, girls, right. Um, in the suicide rate since social media was available on mobile devices in 2008. Between a women between the ages of 15 and 19, the suicide rate has increased 70%. Wow. And this is women 15 to 19. I mean, I remember 15 to 19 worrying about girls and maybe being able to drive someday. You yeah. Know? And, but this, the real shocking one, it's a lower overall number, but the rate is what really shocks me is girls age 10 to 14, the suicide rate increased 151%. That's horrific. One and a half times. Wow. Um, and then what's interesting after that, though, there's also a second study. It's just about hospital admissions for non-fatal self-harm. So I would assume possible not enough pills or not, not enough cut, not deep enough cut, right? Or yeah. something like that, right? Where it's not yeah. fatal. Um, uh, girls 15 to 19 is plus 62%. So it's right along the same rate as the suicide rate. Okay. However, girls age 10 to 14, the suicide rate is 151%. The self, the self harm rate rose 189%. Oh, Jesus. It's almost double. Why? Why do you think? <sighs> And they go through it in the social social dilemma for sure because you you've got filters right, and you're trying to look like somebody you're not. You're trying to look like a Kardashian, right? Aren't they in a lot of trouble right now for being poor or somebody saying they're not billionaires anymore? I, I don't uh, keep up with the Kardashians. Yeah, I don't either. It just <laughs> sometimes it pops into my head because somebody's talking. Okay, you know, somebody's talking about it, but they're kind of under some heat about their elitism, right? Um. Well, this is kind of what that is, is you've got these filters on these women. And in one of the examples, it was like, oh, wow, you look great. You look great. And then you get that one comment. Oh, your ears stick out too far. Right. Yeah. And all you do is focus on that one, you know, one yeah. thing. Because I'm I we, we've talked about the school of common sense, right? Yeah. We are animals, sir. We did evolve. Tribalism is real. Fitting in is real. Like it used to be survival. Right now yeah. it's self survival in a weird way. No, it is definitely. You know, because if we feel outcast, you know what I mean. We we definitely wouldn't survive in the in the wild. Yeah. In so a sense, a, we're all, we're all looking for our tribe, aren't we? We are, and not only that, whatever we meet, we're trying to fit into any tribe. Almost, hmm. it feels because culturally, it's almost like I, I wish our tribe was just humans. I mean, I I don't understand why we can't have that just big tribe. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, I do understand evolution in some of those things, but I think we can out we can slowly remove those consciously. Uh, what let's are your thoughts? That, yeah, I mean, let's hope that we can do that. I, I, yeah. I, I definitely share that that we should we should be thinking of us as humans rather than British or whatever, you know. It, but but it is hard, though, because, you know, a lot of the technology, the advancements that we got are through civilization, through countries, through, you mm -hmm. know, through these through war. How many, you know, quote unquote advancements came out of war, mm -hmm. like advancements in flight and safety and things like that? That's not a good thing. It just happened to be, hand, you know, hand in glove kind of. 
they, but there's they went also, together. There's also a lot of advancements, especially tech, technologically, that came from aliens. <laughs> yeah, true. So where does it end? Are we humans right, or exactly. are we just and, beings? And, yeah. And far, what's interesting, farming actually leads the field in like uh, uh, fertility because they did a lot for like cows, cattle and things like that. Fertility wow. was a big, it's a big driver in the farm industry, for example. Wow. So wow. what is it? So, so it sounds like there's a lot of, especially regarding social media, it's teenagers comparing themselves to other people. I would guess that that is it. Or if they see it's there, it's the desire to fit in so much with everyone that they focus on the one person with whom they don't fit in. Right. Oh, isn't that and, interesting? And think about that. It's very easy when you get a ding with a negative comment, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you've been on Twitter. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I only use Twitter for like happy birthdays, <laughs> congratulations on downloads and talking about either sharing your podcast or someone else's if someone's looking for something or whatever, right? That's what I use it for. But I, you've seen that you've seen those holes that they go down. I mean, they they drop grenades. Yeah, it's a toxic place, Twitter at times. Yeah, I mean, I I ha I tried to have a friendly conversation with someone. It it didn't turn poorly, but the the problem is our communication within between each other is already poor. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, for example, so, somebody made a comment about Joe Rogan being an anti-vaxxer or something. Get that anti-vaxxer, blah blah blah. And I said, could you please clarify? Because my understanding, he's not an anti-vaxxer, but he may have a concern or question about this vaccine, right? Mm. And the guy goes, so I said, what is his, do you mind if, do you mind if he enlighten me on what his stance is? And he goes, I, you'll have to ask him, but he has guys like Alex Jones on. And I'm like, what does that have to do with the vaccination comment that you made? You know, mm. it's, it's that conflation that we do, you know? Yeah. So we push it all together and we all get mad at each other. And look, people are a lot more sensitive than some, some people more sensitive to confrontation than others. Do you think people are more, or maybe teenagers are more sensitive now than teenagers used to be, say 20, 30 years ago? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. This is my, this is my general feel about where we've gone. And I just picked up a book called the coddling of the American mind. Okay. It's by a gentleman named Thomas Haidt. H A I D T. I think he's either American or he's like Nordic. And he, he's been on Joe Rogan before. And I've just watched some interviews with him and he's very intelligent. So I'm very looking forward to that. But it's my opinion that uh, all, growing up, I think getting material goods was much more, much more challenging. Like we didn't have everything at our fingertips, right? I, Amazon here can deliver. I've actually ordered something and gotten something between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. the next day. Wow. That's a little too easy, right? Let's not kid ourselves. That was not an easy thing back in the day. So I think we just had thicker skins in general because life was a little more challenging. Mm. And then as, as our basic needs got met, as these things got easier, we need to next look at the next thing to fix, right? Yeah. Everything if, is if, everything is too immediate at the moment. But I also think we should all love each other and care for each other. So I'm in a really weird spot here. <laughs> we need your, to heal. We need thoughts. We need to heal the world, Mark. That's what we need to do. You know, it would be great, wouldn't it? Oh yeah. So you tell me, what do you think? Every what do you think about it all? What regarding social media or? Yeah, since in the social media, we'll, I, we'll, that was a tangent, I'm sure. So. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of comparing uh, and uh, completely agree with everything that you've said. But also things like, uh, did you watch that? Um, it was heavily promoted on social media. There was a, a series, I can't remember how many seasons they had on Netflix called, uh, it was about teen suicide. Was it 13 Reasons Why? Yes, I did. I watched all of those seasons. And there seemed to be, I mean, it was it was kind of put out as if this is suicide prevention. You know, we're having a really, and, and yeah, there was merit with that, that they were doing a, I guess it was educational, but there was also a, a, at the time there was a lot of kids being influenced by that, and yes. yeah, which I, again I find really alarming. It almost heroicized her, exactly. In a way, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, that and that, I don't know if you ever had that, but I I've heard of stories where like young teenagers get into like a, a fertility pact and they all get pregnant together at wow. like 16 or 17 okay 
it kind of reminds me of like, that's kind of what this does. Like, it's almost like, Hey, let's all get together and do this. Cause she did it, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know. And I, I felt the first season was pretty good, but I felt like it, it went very dramatic after that. It got, it almost got too cartoonish in a way, like too e- extreme. That was like all the things were happening to everybody. Yeah. I only stayed around for the first series. I thought, I thought yeah. it was good, but yeah. The, the um... first one was good. The first one was the best one of the, of the group. But I, I, I don't know. I do wonder why was it put out to shine a light on suicide or was there something underneath that? That's a good question. Mm. And you and I tend to pull back the veil, don't we? A little bit. Well, we try to, you know, um, and, and that's the thing. So these are the statistics, right? We, we've obviously seen some demographics, obviously you and I, what, uh, middle-aged white guys. Yeah. We, can you share that statistic again? The one 45, was it 45 to 49? Uh, 45 to 49. Yeah. What, what was that one again? Uh, Cause I'm smack dab right in the middle of that one. Just that there was the higher, uh, it's the highest rate of suicide between 45 and 49, uh, in the UK. I don't have any figures for that. What are but, your thoughts on why that is? Um, I think one of the reasons could be perhaps uh, someone or a man is finding it difficult to cope with the pressure of providing for his family. Uh, perhaps there's work work issues. Um, but also I think as well as men, we we tend to find it really hard to open up and talk. And also we've we don't we don't promote our own weaknesses or or believe that we can be weak you know we we should be strong men uh but as we were saying earlier there's so many facets to everyone and you know they should all be embraced and i think for some men it's really hard to open up and discuss these kind of things not only is it hard for the man but it's hard for other people to i think sometimes to have those conversations about men traditionally women tend to be able to talk about emotional things a little bit better than the men do. So I think there's a lot of work around that. And I'm guessing that's probably some of the reasons why there is such a high, a high amount of men uh, of that age group committing suicide. And also I think as well, if you, if you get to uh, maybe statistically between the ages of 45 and 49, there might be more uh, people that have split up or that have ended relationships or marriages. And at that point in your life, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, am I going to find someone else? So that's going to add an extra layer on top as well. Again, that goes back to comparing, maybe, you know, comparing yourself with your friends who are in relationships. What what are your thoughts? Why do you think it's so high for men? Yeah. So to your point, uh, you had mentioned it earlier, the comparison thing. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt who was credited with the quote, comparison is the thief of joy. Oh, that's good. Have you ever heard that? Never heard of that. So... (laughs) It is a very good thing. Now, it's funny because like you and I both have podcasts, right? And we look at our metrics, but I never use the metrics as a comparison to another podcast because I don't know what they provide and who their audience is, right? I, they, they could just be more popular, right? They're better. That's an okay thing. I like to measure against, but if you ever do it as a comparison, you will always be disappointed, mm. you know? So I try to do it like a, with a measured metric kind of from a, from a logical point or from a, you know, pragmatic point, not from a, an emotional, oh, they're better than us kind of way. Yeah. You know? But to your point, everyone's doing that, right? Did you see, have you noticed that they have these studios that you can rent out that look like jet, corporate jets so you can take a picture on them and put them on your Instagram? <laughs> no. I mean, they've got full studios that are built that oh, make you crazy. look like you're. That's crazy. Right. So everyone wants to be the best, right? So they're, it's all this fake and that's what's sad. It's like a, it's almost like our currency. It's digital now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not real. Yeah. And when you compare yourself to Vanessa, uh, what's the Vanessa rabbit from Roger rabbit, right? Like if you're going <laughs> to, or Jessica rabbit, you're not going to, you're not going to win. Right. I'm sorry. You're just not going to win. Yeah. Um, but I don't that, think you're, you're, you're not, you're not going to win if you compare yourself to anybody. To anyone. Oh, Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent point. <laughs> um, but to the point about the, the middle aged. So there's a couple points to this, and this actually recently came to my, my attention. I'm a, I'm a constitutionalist. I'm a libertarian. I am a second amendment guy. So it's, it's very hard for me to talk about this, but I'm going to be honest. Um, I will be sharing that canopy website that I told you about. There is okay, a, I- there, there is a show called suicide examined. 
And the statistics are as, as such. 60% of gun violence deaths are by suicide. Wow. 60% of United States deaths by handgun or by gun are suicides. Wow. Hmm. So here's the thing. Men tend to be better at doing it when they do it or when they attempt. Because if you notice, women attempts, I think, are higher than men. Okay. But men, when they cut, they cut deeper. When they, when they go, they use guns. They don't use pills, right? So the example was a woman who takes a handful of pills still has like maybe an hour. She could call for help and get her stomach pumped, right? Mm -hmm. You could go through your process of, I don't want to die, right? Yeah. I don't know how much a jumper, how far after they jump decides I want to live, right? But it's at that point, it's obviously too late. Yeah. But with the way women kill themselves, generally, they haven't like carbon monoxide, pills, things like that. They can actually get help before it's over. With a gunshot, you pull the trigger. It's such a short time and the immediacy of the effect, you don't have that chance to actually change your mind. So why do men go for that immediacy then? Men, I think that's a biological thing. Men are more assertive, violent, physical. Okay. I, that's my opinion. I, I could be wrong, but it, I think to your point, men being less emotional, right? They're like, mm. well, this is now a task I need to do. Yeah. Um, if yeah, that makes that's sense. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So what I've noticed is just men are more aggressive with the decision once they make it. Okay. And they have less of a time to really change. Now, but to your point, not just talking about it would help, you know, hmm. um, you've mentioned it. And what's interesting about this is like, where do you feel that, uh, where do you feel that you can interfere with someone or, or where can you feel you can help someone or intervene? Like at what level, how far can you go? Um, I think you can go all the way. You 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 can you can talk someone out of out of their suicidal ideation. Um, I've, I always say it that every suicide is preventable. Well, I'd like to think that every suicide is preventable, but it starts with that conversation. Uh, I was I was talking to uh, someone a couple of days ago, and they were talking about uh, the life and soul of the party. Like, how do you? I've I've had examples in, in in my life with friends who uh, who have been the life and soul of the party, and no one knew that they were going through whatever they were going through, um, and had someone you know maybe picked up on a certain sign because typically there are signs uh, that someone is thinking about ending their life. Um, typically, if they could pick up on that and then start that conversation, I believe, or it's my opinion, that we can talk those people uh, we can talk those people down. It might not be immediate. It might you know t take quite a period of time but it's just important just to keep hammering away um at that conversation are are you okay i've, I've noticed that uh, you're not quite yourself uh, do you want to talk about that and actually talking about suicide as well there's a real myth that if we mention the word suicide to someone who's contemplating it that that's going to trigger them to uh, to to kill themselves <clears throat> it's not i think the more you talk about suicide the more you mention the word suicide it takes away that taboo um, it does. It almost takes away the power of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, to your point, it's funny. You were talking about life of the party. Uh, do you remember Robin Williams, for example? Yes. Yeah. You yeah. would never have guessed no. that that person was hurting. And I, it's my opinion, because I'm semi Robin Williams, like not as obviously I don't have the talent that he had, but I'm that like scatterbrainy. Okay. <laughs> um, I could see that easily happening. I think right. he had some kind of heart condition that turned and then he, and then it happened. Uh, it kind of happened interestingly for him. Didn't he but, have, um, he had some brain condition, didn't he? That was diagnosed after he died. Yes. He probably had some CT as well. And I, that's something I'd like to talk about. Um, do you mind if I sprinkle in one of my personal stories? Go for it, Mark. Sprinkle away. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Megan and I were, uh, heading back to Philadelphia. I, I'm from the Philadelphia area and we flew back and there's a German club that we're part of and my family is and everything. And I, it was October of 2019. 
uh, very early, the first week. And I used to play soccer growing up in the German club. We were actually very good. We had a very, we had a, you, I think our, our 34, 35 majors were in the world or state or country championships or something. Unbelievable. They played across, you know, we played, we had exchanges with Germany a lot because we were a German club. So this kid was the star player and his dad was a coach and he was a junior, right? So it was, you know, this guy, junior, um, I come home and I was like, yeah, I, I was thinking about running into this guy and that guy. And my mom said, oh my gosh, someone said there was a funeral for that name. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that guy's dad died. Right. I just, you know what I mean? I went right to the father. Right. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Turns out it was the junior who killed himself. Oh and um, 44, 45, the same age as I am. Um, I grew up, you know, with him. I always bumped into him. It's, you know, at school or the German club or whatever, because we played, we were teammates and everything. I was never really close with him, but he was like a pretty popular jock. He'd actually played soccer uh, at Temple University, I think. And I think he had played soccer at a, as he was a coach at somewhere. But it's my opinion that he had two kids, right? And you're like, how does he leave his children? But I saw a picture of him and the kid that I saw, you know, I, I feel like emotionally, he physically started looking like he felt emotionally. Okay. He looked awful. And I, I don't mean that with any disrespect or judgment, but he wasn't the person I remember seeing growing up. You know what I mean? Mm. He'd like let go. Right. And I, I personally think it's why we did an episode on CTE and TBI and brain damage and things, concussions. Those are a big play. And I think in soccer, actually, it's or football in your case, um, that's a huge, that actually is a very underdiagnosed uh, condition. Hmm. There was a CTE is a big one. There was a, have you heard of Troy's story? No. Yeah, it was, um, it, <sighs> There was a, like a website, I think it started off with a blog post. Uh, it was a wife set this up after her husband passed away. He was, I think he was a school administrator, really successful career, a great family, absolutely adored his wife, had a, a really close uh, network of friends. And uh, she received a call one day to say that her, son, uh, her uh, husband had killed himself. And uh, it turned out that through like investigating why it happened, it was because he had had uh, this, uh, was it CT? Uh, yeah, CTE. Yes, CTE. Yeah, uh, I think that I was just after, pulled it up as well. Yeah, it was after like a concussion uh, from an accident, and he had been addicted to opioid medication because he the pain that he was experiencing uh, was so great, and um, yeah. he was scared that this addiction was gonna was gonna be uncovered. Yeah, yeah, it's really pretty crazy. And yeah. so, just to let you know, and I don't know if you listened to that episode, but in our we there was one article. Uh, that was published with 111 NFL players, ex NFL players. Yeah. 110 of the 111 had signs of CTE. Wow. And that included a kicker and a punter, I think, at least one kicker and one punter. Right. And we're talking only one of 111 people did not have it. That's and crazy. then we obviously have different varying degrees, right? Mm. Um, to that end, I actually think when is somebody going to use CTE as the I killed my wife and kids defense. Like OJ could seriously have CT. I'm not defending the actions of OJ Simpson, hmm. but he, it could easily have been due to that lack of, it's really impulse control that you yeah. have. Yeah. Um, but you know, once again, it's just, I like to bring up ideas and tell, you know, tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really interesting. There's definitely merit. There's definitely merit there. So you, I don't know what to say to that, Mark. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't really heard much about uh, CTE, and um, but there, there definitely seems to be some something there from what you're saying. And I will admit, I think that's part of our age group. Yeah, and is, uh, is, 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 there, is there any statistics around that and suicide? There is statistics around CTE and suicide. I'll pull some things together. Uh, okay. You know what? Maybe we'll do one if we do a follow up. Maybe in a few, six, maybe three, four months. A okay. couple months, we can do a follow up and do it maybe sports related and show because you and I shared some stories this week that happened or, or recently, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you to... want to share that the football player that, that or the footballer, the soccer yeah. player? I, I I don't follow football. Uh, this came from a mate, but um, there was uh, I think his name was Lee Collins. I think thirty one, thirty two. 
he was found uh, dead in his hotel room. Um, I can't I, I can't remember how he killed himself. I don't know if they reported that. Um, but yeah. And, so, and you shared you shared something as well, didn't you, Mark? Yeah, I did. Um, this week alone, uh, there was an ex NFL player. His name is Philip Adams. He gunned down five people and then killed himself. Wow. And his sister, right? He, here, here's the clickbait. Okay, he wasn't a monster. Sister of an ex ex NFL player. Blah blah blah. She says she claims that it was because of all the injuries that he went through. The head injury. His mental health degraded yeah. fast and terribly bad, is what they said. Right. And um, it's underrated, right? Like this warrior sport stadium, you know, mm. bravado thing, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, it, it can have detrimental effects that we're seeing. And it's actually pretty prevalent among women as well. Uh, concussions among women in soccer, specifically with head balls and accidental like kicks to the head, are, are increasing. At least the reporting of it's increasing uh, pretty greatly. Wow. You know, and then you've got guys like a wrestler, professional wrestlers, right? Uh, Chris Benoit killed his wife and two children and then killed himself. And then they, you know, you look at him and obviously he had PEDs, steroids, whatever, but there was also the CTE from con night after night getting dropped on your head, you know? Mm. Wrestling, was a obviously. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say there was a documentary on Netflix. I can't for the life of me think it was, was it net? Yeah, I think it was Netflix. I can't remember what it, who it was about, but it was a sports personality in America. And I think he had killed a couple of people. Um, and it turned out after his death that it was to do with some injury that he had to his head. Yeah. There was one in the clock tower. If you're familiar with the, the shooting in Texas in the clock tower in the sixties. Yeah. I'm familiar with that. So that gentleman, there was actually a brain, there was a tumor growing on his head, pressing against a portion of his brain. Wow. So that when they, they found that out after, obviously, because what happened was he started having some behavioral changes. So obviously there are many times it's emo emotional, right, Tony? Yeah. But we're finding that there are some physical ailments that can actually exacerbate these conditions as well. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And just going back to what you were saying earlier about guns, uh, men yes. and guns. Do you think that if the gun laws weren't as they are in, in America, that there would be less suicides? Or do you think? Um, do you... Well, I think maybe the attempts would be higher than the results. Right. Yeah. There'd be a greater gap because they try it a different way. And the way it makes sense is like you have when you take pills or when you're doing carbon monoxide or something, there's time. Time is a very important element, obviously, to get to make, you know, to keep you from dying, right? Mm. If there's a longer time between when you start your attempt and, you know, the end, that gives you that cushion, whereas gun violence wouldn't. Personally, I, this is, I have a weird thing about guns. I hope maybe this one's going to bite me in the butt and I'm okay agreeing to disagree, but in America, the freedoms about this, the freedom of speech and the freedom of the, the bearing of arms kind of go hand in glove for me and it sucks that people are irresponsible with guns they should not be you need to be a responsible gun owner that said it's kind of like speech right you can't just remove freedom of speech because one person's saying crazy shit yeah I, yeah I, I agree with that but why why is that i understand freedom of speech but why does there have to be a bearing of arms what, yeah what's that well the, about? There is a tipping point of that point, just to be clear. I want to be very, uh, to your point, very common sense. Like, I'm wondering at what point that I would go, okay, now it's too much, right? Like, because yeah. cause I do, don't, I don't want bad for anything. Ultimately, back in the day, the, the right to bear arms was really the last, it was kind of like to, so that we wouldn't have another dictatorship. It was really the last, it's the last check and balance on the, of the people against the state. Plus, back then, they had to be part of the militia, right? They were Minutemen. Like, they, they didn't have an army yet. And they also hunted bear. I mean, they hunted for food. So everybody had guns. Like, guns was not really a thing to worry about. But it, it's a very nuanced question, right? Yeah. Without without digging too much of a – putting my foot too much in my mouth. But uh, – I'm wondering I, if bearing of arms is still, still relevant. You know, we're it, not – It, it, we're not, it we're does – hunting, yeah. are we? Well, it, it does bear the question, but because ultimately, like, if what's our way of protecting ourselves against like a military force such as the United States military? 
with a pea shooter. Like, it's just not going to happen, right? So logically, that doesn't really make sense, right? So I'm yeah. very open to, I, I, it's my opinion that there should be like a test for it uh, in some way. Like, I took like an 800, like 800 question questionnaire to be a Pizza Hut driver. Right. You know what I mean? Well, like, we can't no, do that no whether test. you're going to. There's no test to buy a gun. No, there's no test. I can walk in right now and buy one. Well, I, I could do it. I could have, I could probably get, well, right now, because of the gun stuff, they're trying to thing. There's probably a couple lines out there <laughs> at all the right. stores, but I could, within a couple hours, I could, I could send you a picture of a brand new gun that I purchased. Wow. Yeah. It's look, I'm not, is it too easy? Yes. Abs like it, if you're asking me if there's better ways to do this, yes, this shouldn't just be like, I can just be me and just walk in and go, hi, you know. I don't agree with the way it's done. Correct. But, you know, wow. it's interesting. I would like to do, you know, maybe we should do a, a, a constitutional one and we can, you can shit on all our constitutional <laughs> rights. Damn it. No, but, uh, but I think that's only something fair I will because, always be open to talk about. I promise. I think that's only fair because didn't you do an episode on the Royal family? I did. Yeah. So actually yeah. Chris and I did. Okay. Well, wait, I'm looking forward to our next one. We're going to do UK versus US. Yeah, that should be, fun. be a fun. One. Yeah. So, yes, but back to guns. Like, um, to your point, it there needs to be something changed. I, but we're not, see, no one wants, no one wants to talk about what needs to be changed. They just want to put their piece on it, right? Like, mm. I want it to be X and these other guys want it to be Y, but no one's talking in the middle and saying, can we agree on something? You know what I mean? Yeah. Both parties are digging their heels. And I, look, we, we can't get together and move forward together until, I mean, compromise sucks, but compromise is compromise for a reason, right? Exactly. So anyway, um, yes, but the, I, to your point, yes, I think gun violence would, or obviously changes. Now, what's the question on that? How would you want to change it? Just remove it altogether or, or, or what? On, on the suicide, on the, on the suicide subject. Like how would how would we implement some kind of gun removal or gun prevention? Well, from uh, someone with suicidal ideation from having a gun. Okay, but I mean, like, would you test for it or? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't you need to have a mental health test before you buy or get a license for a firearm? And there should be some more stringent measures in place to buy a firearm but then i guess if it's all to do with bearing of arms and free speech i can see why there isn't yeah but there's an interesting part of that because <laughs> i've read that second amendment and it says the right to bear arms shall not be prohibited but it says for, for being for a well-regulated militia so they already had some kind of regulated militia piece in there and I'm wondering, can they use the regulated part as their loophole to make some kind of testing to make to regulate it? Maybe. You know, I, I, that's what I was always curious about, because once again, I will dissect anything. I will talk about any subject openly because um, I don't have an answer till till it's finalized. Right. Like mm. every answer is possible until we have the final answer. So um, I, it needs to change, though, I think. I absolutely believe like, look, I think that having children should be licensed, Tony. So I don't, know. <laughs> I mean, we do it to drive. I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about creating someone and, and, and like molding them into what you do for 18 years and then sending them out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's, it's pretty dangerous, right? <laughs> it yeah. could be, but anyway, so back to this. So I think 45 to 49 men, I, this is one of the weird subjects and please tell me if you think I'm a little off, but we feel like we're not the contributors that we used to be to the world. Yeah. Okay. Cause I feel like we're told that we're not the contributors that we used to be to the world. Do we have to be the contributors to the world? No, we don't. But if you think about our age group and when we grew up, we were right. That was our childhood probably. Yeah. I think they're being told that they're not as important as they used to feel they were. Okay. I don't, I, I really think it's like a misunderstanding if, if I were to be clear about it. Um, but imagine like, I don't know an example. Let's see, like, well, did, 
you mentioned your childhood a little bit. Did both your parents work or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you and I are probably in that weird transitional generation where we both had both parents working at some point in some way or another. But prior to us, right, there would have been that, you know, men bring home the bacon, that BS right. talk that we had back in the day, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think with that change, that's where a lot of that mentality change. But it's hard to change culturally because when you're growing up, you're kind of living in a vacuum in your family, right? Yeah. It wasn't until I left my house and went to college that I really saw gray in the world other than black and white myself, hmm. you know? So, but no, you know, I'm also it, biased, Tony. I'm a white guy. <laughs> No, it's an interesting point. It is an interesting point. And it's one that I think I need to try and get my head around uh, a little bit more. Yeah. And look, I, these are opinions, nothing. I will sit with anyone and have a conversation about anything. Now, what's interesting, like, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with like the meritocracy argument? I've never heard that phrase until okay. today. A meritocracy. So meritocracy. Is yeah. So meritocracy basically is saying, Whoever can get the job done, it doesn't just tell me who, you know, who has the merit to get it done, right? right? Well, the problem with that is there is a bias to it because not everybody starts at the same point, right? Like yeah. I, I have an advantage living in a suburb over uh, as someone like in a, in a deep city who doesn't have the same school budget that a suburb might have. Right. So yeah. our starting points are different. So meritocracy is really hard to say everybody equal or just on their merits because not everybody's equal to start. But right. Yeah. That's also life, though. Right. I mean, I I've broken my leg before and that sucked, but I dealt with it. Right. And I'm not that's not to belittle any of the other stuff. I'm just these are all the ideas coming up. Right. All mm -hmm. the ideas are bubbling up and we have to kind of hit them one by one in that way, in my opinion. Yeah. So, um, any final thoughts on the 45 to 49? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Are you exhausted already? <laughs> I, I'm um, quite interested in the, um, the females. Um, and, and, and like you were talking about, uh, younger girls and, uh, and teenage, teenage girls, young women, um, in, in mental health, I definitely see uh, in the last 10 years, I've seen a rise in personality disorders, uh, personality disorder. Um, there's various different personality disorders. I don't need to educate anyone on, on those. But uh, with personality disorder, especially chronic um, variations of that comes an increase in suicide, suicidal ideation or attempts. Very often, uh, and you're absolutely right, uh, very often, uh, it would be females and they will, will make an attempt, but it won't lead to suicide. Um, and I wonder if the higher rate of, of females under 25, I wonder how much of those um, have, are experiencing personality disorder. I think there's a bit of a trend at the moment, uh, especially with social media uh, and uh, various TV series or Netflix series that some teenagers hold mental health or personality disorder as a bit of a badge of honor um I, I can remember it was about five years ago there was a real increase in uh young people uh, being diagnosed with depression and anxiety and that seemed to be fueled by social media and like global trends i guess but what are your yes. thoughts on what are your thoughts on 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 like personality disorder and and women and do you think that could be do you think that could be why the rates are so high I mean, also, there, there is also social media. Um, well, you know, su suicide is a mental problem, the, or it's a, it's it's much more of an emotional than a physical issue. Would you would you argue that point? A absolutely, yeah. Okay, with that, there are a couple things, in my opinion. I hope that I I always talk too much, Tony, so I apologize. But let's start with diet and the child being born. I think the food is not as natural as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, people on formula versus breastfeeding, uh, different, you know, additives and I don't know, pesticides or whatever to, to meals, GMOs being in food. Uh, have you noticed that women seem to be, uh, what's that called? Maturing quicker, possibly. No, no I haven't noticed So that. there's a little bit of a, like physically maturing quicker because of say steroids or, or hormones in foods or things like that. Okay. I think 
that diet is a huge thing that's under under uh undervalued in this do you know what i mean yeah so uh, nutrition the benefits of nutrition on mental health right so i yeah. think that the ch many of the children start off on a really bad foot with all the distractions that parents have in the world so you know they get fast food or they get easier meals right mm -hmm. it's just an easy thing to do let's throw a you know a whatever pre-made thing in the oven and be done with it um microwave right that could yeah. do some we don't know all those effects so i think diet is part of it and then i do think the it's my opinion that the culture of this victimization like being a victim is all we can be now yeah and it seems like the bigger victim it gets the bigger attention right the squeakier wheel gets the bigger grease yeah so if you've noticed, everyone's been a victim. Even look, I'm a af, I'm an affluent, middle aged, white guy, middle class, very content in love. And look at me, I'm I, I said I was a victim ten minutes ago, right? Like that. Yeah. I think that's part of it. To your point, the badge of honor is a great point. It's how much different can I be, and I need to make you accept me. Yeah, and that goes, that's exactly what you were talking about at the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's unfortunate. Um, because I, it, it, when you get, I think you can run a country with a billion people if you run it like China runs it. Cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's good, yeah. but it's effective, right? We're talking about working effic eff efficacy, effic efficacy, eff with that, whatever, whatever that word is. <laughs> but we're we're 300 for example the united states like 330 individual victims right now it's very hard to agree on anything when we're so individualized mm. i'm not that is not a statement to go that the other way because freedom and i'm always about personal and individual freedoms but i also wish that we would recognize that we need community too yeah. in a way yeah. you know um, I'm in a, I'm this weird guy. Like I, I'm a pro choice guy. I used to be pro death penalty. Now I'm against it. Um, I, I've never been on the church, the God side, but I also understand that God, like the whole church was about community. And I wish we could find something to replace God in today's world and, but keep a community, right? That mm -hmm. makes it our tribe and we can all hang out together and it'd be great. Tony, we're all humans, right? Can't we just be the human tribe? And yeah, right now we can't. Can't we just all get along? Can't we? Rodney King did say it best, my friend. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that part of it or on what, on the nutrition and just the general kind of cultural change that we're going through? Yeah, I do. I do agree with that. And I think, but I think also that that, that change is always going to happen. So that, so if, if things like nutrition and community changes is affecting people's mental health and suicide rates, then that's only going to get worse as the years go by. Yeah. Uh, because food is going to get faster. Life is going to continue to change. Right. And, and to your point, um, I think, I think that we've chemically or slightly changed our genetic or our mental structure with our diet or with our nutrition in a way. Hmm. I mean, that's part of it, right? That's not all yeah. of it. Oh yeah. The, and not just suicide. Obviously I'm thinking, I'm saying mental illness start uh, in my opinion can, you know, nutrition plays a part in mental illness. Mental illness can grow, exacerbate, and then turn to suicide. Right. Yeah. In this case, what are your thoughts about the multiple personalities or the personality disorders that you experience? What are your thoughts about, what are your thoughts about all that? What, what could be causing all of that? I don't know. I've never really thought about what could what could be causing that. Um, generally, most people that uh, come into our services or the services that I've worked worked out throughout the years have had some kind of traumatic experience in childhood, um, or perhaps uh, a head injury, you know, like, like we spoke about before. Um, it's interesting because personality disorder. I think it was only recently it was actually uh, classified as a mental health condition. Um, and I can remember at least 10 years ago, personality disorders, 
uh, they weren't so prevalent with, within the service. Uh, we'd, we'd be dealing more with your schizophrenia, bipolar, depression. Uh, but now it seems to it seems to be that personality disorder is kind of taking over those traditional mental health conditions. And I don't know why. I don't know the reasons why. It could be, it, it must be a whole variety of, of different things. It could be, like you say, from diet to social media to influence to the way we've been brought up. But there's, yeah, there's definitely something going on there with personality disorder really interesting but also it's a it's a horrific uh, condition to be suffering from and what's what i found interesting now i could be incorrect do you find it more prevalent among female Definitely. the female sex and the male sex or we're talking yeah. biology here not gender or any yeah. i'm completely biological yeah there's definitely more females uh, or I've come into contact with definitely more females with personality disorder than, than males. Not to say that, uh, you know, I haven't worked with males with personality disorder, but uh, yeah, definitely more females. But there's also the theory that uh, mental health is increasing to do with the pharmaceutical industry and that perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, that perhaps uh, ev not everybody that goes to see their doctor is actually experiencing uh, mental health problems, but they're given a shitload of tablets and um and things things just get worse yeah and that goes into kind of nutrition on my end like supplements any kind yeah. of medication mental health things like that because i've i've noticed an increase well i've certainly noticed an increase in the dispensing of mental health pills and i'm wondering if maybe someone goes in with a condition gets handed these pills the pills actually create a change in the in the way the person feels a chemical change that somehow gets ingrained and then could get passed on who knows right we don't know right yeah yeah and also you might be given a certain medication but then you might have to take another med medication to offset the side effects of the original medication uh, which 32 all, medications all later yeah, exactly. You have an itchy left ear, yeah. <laughs> right? It's like the weirdest thing, right? I one of my favorite commercials are there was some anti-stroke thing that said uh, side effect could be stroke, and I'm I'm like I I guess you have to say that, and that's more like the legal part of it, right? Like there's to your point, there's no common sense. Exactly. Anymore. Where has common sense gone? Yeah, and that's. That's what Mark, well, and, <laughs> why do you think suicide is such a taboo subject? Among men, because of the shame. To your point, I, it's my opinion that we are supposed to be the strong people, right? We're supposed to be the ones who don't have problems. We're supposed to carry the weight. But yeah. that's a very antiquated thought process, isn't it? It is. Um, yeah, it's a and, thought process that's been carried down from generations. Right. And with the increase in technology, though, the change from that mindset to the new one was so drastic that I th I feel some people got left behind a little bit. All right. And I don't know if that makes sense, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like you got to catch the bus, right? Or else you're, yeah. you're, you're not getting Unless, to your destination. Yeah. Or you're left behind. Right. Yeah. Um, and I feel the people who left behind probably feel more lost and they're also in that old school. So they don't talk about it. That then snowballs, right? Hmm. How about you? How about you? What do you, what do you think? Uh, what do you attribute it to? Yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it is shame. I think it's, there is a degree of feeling like we said before, not, not just men, not just for men, but for women as well of, of, of admitting to weakness or of admitting to the underlying, uh things that are bringing on the suicidal thoughts um yeah. you know it's one thing to admit that you're suicidal but it's something else to admit what's going on underneath um and also it's such a personal thing as well suicide uh, yeah yeah and um i'll one more thing i'll share like is hormones is some extent too uh i had my blood work done and i've had some i haven't felt great like not physically not great, but just more like mentally cloggy. I've had some physical intimacy things as a middle aged man would. Okay. Low testosterone, my friend. Oh. So I found out I was like below the lowest number. So I started doing some TRT, testosterone replacement. The la this is my fourth week, and I will say that my cognition has upticked slightly and my sharpness has upticked slightly. Wow. 
So I think that that health, it, there is a definite body, mind, health, you know, bo- emotional, physical condition as well. Definitely. Um, and we don't even realize, like, as our body, as we get older, some of those hormones get less produced. And we're wondering why we feel sluggish or this or that or the other. And I will say I, I started taking that and it's it's definitely shown slight uptick in that in my in my mood for sure. Wow. So you think that the hormone de- decreasing was because of um, age rather than it's age else? and time. Yes. Yeah. So over time, testosterone does. I had a vasectomy at 34. So it's my opinion. My body already knew that I didn't need as much testosterone for the other stuff. Right. So I like the range is 300 to 1000. And I just got tested about a month, two months ago. And it was like 236. Wow. So I was below even the bottom number. Um, so he's like, hey, let's do this. And I said, let's try it. And it's definitely had an uptick for sure. So, you know, getting checked with a medical professional doesn't hurt either. You know? No. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. also there's a real, like, just going back to the body and the mind connection, there's a, there is a definite uh, correlation between that. Yeah. Um, I've started up a, a walking group uh, on Facebook and I've noticed within myself, if I walk... Uh, say 15 kilometers walk for an hour and a half my cognitive abilities are increased i feel a lot better and and i don't think it's just because of endorphins i just think that there is there's that well, increased blood flow yeah right? exactly you're getting yeah. more oxygen to every place i mean there's so many benefits to walking for example yeah yeah exercise is a great stress reliever as well definitely uh, so that's a good point for the uh, to help with uh combating if you feel this way right but unfortunately it is but i think that only works at perhaps the initial stages because i think once you really get deep into those those feelings when you go down that rabbit hole motivation goes out the window and I absolutely think you, you start your reality becomes becomes a bit skewed i guess very myopic right you get a very yeah. like uh your the walls close and you see one option yeah tunnel vision so to that point this is my thought. Let's, uh, I would love to go through some of the warning signs. Okay. And then I think we should talk about how, if we see someone in this situation that we think might feel suicidal, how, how to approach them or how to talk to them. Would, yeah, does that also, make, would that work for you? Yeah. And one of the emails uh, from one of our listeners uh, talks quite a lot about um, uh, what to do in those situations. So it'd be good to include that as well. Yeah, so let's do some of the warning signs and then we'll do we'll we'll introduce the email and yeah. then we'll talk about the other ways. Okay. So in your in your experience, what have you, what are some of those warning signs that you've seen and and researched about that are really important that we need to be aware, aware of? Uh getting their affairs in order um is is quite a big one. Uh like giving away uh possessions, giving away prized possessions. Um also being more helpful than they've been before and that that sounds a bit strange because really everyone should be helping each other Uh, but if you notice a dramatic change like that that someone's actually you know taking the time to be to be a little bit more helpful there could be something else going on Uh, and normally there isn't just one one sign there's 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 a a variety of signs so getting their affairs in order perhaps they might make a will or uh, give away things uh, talking about suicide or maybe not talking about suicide, but saying things like maybe in a jokey manner, Oh, I'll just be better off dead. Or I wish I hadn't been born. I think if you hear those kinds of things, um, routinely, then that could be a cause for concern. Uh, isolation withdrawing from others is a big one as well. Um, I, I know that in my experiences uh, or during one of those, uh, that, that definitely happened. I completely isolated, um, from family, from friends and from people. Um, so do you want to share a little bit about that or do you want to table that for later? We'll table that for later. Okay. Excellent. Um, and, and just feeling like help, helpless and hopeless or feeling that, 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 that they're trapped. They might say, oh, there's no way out of this situation or, or they might feel that they're in a situation that is going to be a lot worse than it is. Uh, what about you? What, what kind of signs? Uh, can you think of so all of those that you mentioned um i just pulled up a list so i'm i've i cheated (laughs) um but increase of uh dependent substances like drugs or alcohol is a big one yeah um i you know i've noticed it 
among people close to me and, and as well as myself. Right. And the drug can be anything like, like I mentioned, mine is food mm. and I'm happy to share. I'm happy to share that. Uh, once we go through these two pieces, cause I don't want to, you know, okay. this is very important. Uh, but acting to your point, you were talking about being more helpful. Um, one of the signs like day of, or with in a very short time frame, is an increase in mood, like a positive uptick because the decision has already been made in their head. Yeah. It can bring a sense of calm and relief. Yeah, uh, yeah. Relief. Relief yeah. is one I've heard. I've heard the story of, I heard that Chris Cornell, the, the musician, mm. the night that he killed himself, he was super affable and super like gregarious and came out. I think he even came out for an encore, like something that he would never have done in his normal troubled state or, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. What he thought was a troubled state. So I found that interesting. Um, isolating is much, uh, not sleeping enough or sleeping too much. Right. Yeah pulling the covers over your head, very big sign of depression or the inability to sleep because you're just burdened. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, mood swings, those types of things. I, it, I don't want to say funny. It's interesting. I was talking, we were, I was driving with Megan, we were going to a store and I pointed to my head about something. She goes, are you going to shoot yourself or something? She was making like a weird I go, yeah, actually, let's do it. Let's just get it done with now. And like, I made a self-deprecating joke and didn't even realize it. Right. You know, so yeah. it's always in there somewhere. You know what I mean? It's always something that's always not, it's not at the immediate, but it's in my reach that I need to keep away, you know? Yeah. Um, the last one I'd like to talk about is that talking about being a burden to others. Mm. Have you, ex I've, I feel like I've experienced that one a lot yeah. where even though they're the helpful ones, they feel like they're the ones draining, right? Yeah. Um, have you had any personal experience with anything like that? Yeah, uh, definitely felt that I was a burden of other uh, uh, for, for other people. Uh, the the world would be better off if if I wasn't around, and that that ties in with this feeling of, I guess, self loathing and self hatred. Or I mean, yeah. that's a strong word, isn't it? But feeling that you're not worth you're not worth much. Right, because these are feelings. I mean, it doesn't make it a reality. These are exactly, exactly, yeah. These these are feelings, but like we said earlier, once you get into that state, those feelings completely take over you, and they become your reality. I yes. remember during one of my uh, attempts, I felt that, yeah, I felt that I was a burden, but it, it got to such an extreme level that I felt that I I was diseased, and that if anyone came into contact with me, they I would pass this disease on to them. Yes. And that's completely illogical, but right. And that increases the isolation on top of yeah. that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't even, yeah, I, I know what you mean. And my, it, do you mind if I share mine really quickly before okay. we move yeah. on? So yeah. my, mine was never, I've never had a direct attempt. I've had ideations out the wazoo, but I've never had a direct attempt. But what I did growing up was I had a really bad car accident. Uh, when I was 13 and I gained 70 pounds over a two year period. And uh, I basically just decided that food would be my drug. So food was my crutch, uh, anything emotional I'd eat. And I'm only five foot eight. I got up to about two, I got to 297 pounds is what I remember on the scale. Wow. Uh, and I'm, there's pictures of me where I'm complete, I'm unrecognizable. And as a matter of fact, I posted on Facebook 17 years ago, uh, there's a picture of me with Coolio in Las Vegas <laughs> and a picture of me just last week. And if you look at the difference, you can see I I feel like I exude the health or the, you know what I mean? The health that I that I feel now. Yeah. I look different. So my my thing was always, I'm just going to eat myself to death. I'm going to have a heart attack at 40. No big deal. You know, I it was such a passive way of doing it. And did you um, actually, so that was a conscious thought that you were going to eat yourself to death? Oh yeah. I, I remember John Candy dying at 43. I remember seeing the the thing, John Candy, I go, I'll beat him. I think that was the first thing I said when I saw that article or whatever I read, I said, I'll be, I'll, I'll beat him to the grave. Right. And I said it kind of jokingly, but I, no, I don't, I didn't want to be here. I'm not going to lie. I just didn't, I didn't feel like I wanted to be here. There, that's interesting. There is a, there is a term for that. I can't remember what it is, but there's a word for someone who, uh, 
in effect commit suicide over a long period of time because traditionally we think of suicide as being quite an immediate thing although some Correct. Might you say, think it was an attempt right an attempt yeah. and a, either a failure or a success yeah uh yeah, yeah i'm gonna look that up as we talk. yeah and, and that's what it was and can i be honest with you tony i couldn't i don't know if i could kill myself with my parents still alive right and what causes the mental problems in my brain is what causes me to keep from doing that worst thing that you could possibly do right. um, is just shame. If I brought shame upon my family, like, I don't know if I, I couldn't live with that. <laughs> literally. I know that sounds awful, but um, you know what I mean? Like I, I literally could not do that to my family. So it's interesting that the, Committing suicide uh, brings about this feeling. Of, I mean, commit, <clears throat> committing suicide <clears throat> is infused with shame, but then if if it's completed, it then brings shame onto the family or to the loved ones. Yeah. Uh huh. Because our our family was, I mean, my parents were both born in Germany, so 1940 and 1944. Uh, you kind of know that time period in Europe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, when they came here, they met here and the pride of Germany, you just couldn't do wrong. You know what I mean? You had to show what you show people, what you show people outside is not what was really going on inside. Yeah. So when you heard, when you heard really interesting comments, like, oh, your ex is such a great person, whatever. And you're like that person, how come I don't see that? You know, and everyone else is telling me that, you know, that's kind of our family, you know, that you had to put up that facade of perfection. Um, and the shame that goes with any of that other stuff. Yeah. Because the judgment, the Germ Germans are <laughs> extremely personally judgmental in that way, you know. Um, so it's a, it was a culture thing for me, for sure. And does, is that still prevalent now? Yes, but I've kind of stepped a lot away from my family. My family's, I'll, I'll share that probably with you a little offline. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm happy to talk about it. I just don't want to record it quite yet. Yeah, I've got okay. thoughts about doing doing episodes on that. But uh, I, I will say this, my parents, uh, they, they truly do love me. I, I am fortunate. I'm blessed. I was blessed to have the childhood I had. But there were some challenges too, right? Just like anything else. Yeah. So, and it's it's how we process them as well. Um, but I will say I've, I've had to the point of like physical harm. I've had three real cases where I had traumatic trauma to, or traumatic injury to my brain. I had a, uh, hatchback car door slam on the back of my head, like top of my head when I was like seven or eight, someone closed it when I ducked my head in. And then I had, I flew out of a car at 50 some miles an hour, <laughs> hit my head then. And then I had a car where I was really scooted up in the front seat and an airbag blew up in my face on mm -hmm. the passenger side. So it kind of knocked me like pretty loopy. So I, I feel like those, those do create some scars and those have you know, those are always mental. Those will create mental issues down okay. the road. So I do, there is a big physical mental, I mean, the physical and mental go hand in hand in glove as well. Yeah, definitely. So, and is there anything so we went you... over? Oh, sorry, Carol. Go, please. No, no, go on. You go. Oh, that was it. I was just going to move on. So, <laughs> uh, so, if, are you concerned that mental health, your mental health, is going to be impacted in the future? And if so, is that what can you do to to try to offset that? Or uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to know that answer because I've had <laughs> conversation with with Megan about it. Um, I don't know if if what we're talking about is outside of the realm of my possibility at some point in my life. Right. Okay. It's all it's it will be when I when I'm at the point where I feel like my personal pain is too is too great and the burden on others is too great. Yeah. And you bastard, you got to make me think about that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So but uh, is we're going to have a but, two minute but, drying eye period. <laughs> But is that burden a reality, though? You know, we kind of talk about when we're 
when, when, when we're in that point, we, we do think that that burden is a reality, but perhaps it isn't actually, you know, real. Like you say, it's feelings, isn't it? You're 100% correct. And I think there's a, there's a range of that, right? Like, would I want Megan to sit at my bedside 24 hours a day, right, dipping, yeah. dipping a, a sponge into water and putting on my lips? No, yeah. no, that, that takes away her life. Mm. Right. Like that's where I would like, for example, that's one example. Right. Yeah. And that's not exactly a life for me either. No. Lying there, having my lips dabbed with a wet sponge for two years. God, that's a lot to deal with, isn't it? It really is. And that's, that's why this is very important because there's a very fine line between like, I, you know, assisted suicide, like euthanasia, when you're at the point you're, you're 82 years old and you've got so many health problems, you know, you just wanted to go away. Hmm. And before that point, you know, Hmm. so, and I don't know, it's, it's a, that's why we're talking about it. Right. Yeah. But in, in your, in your experience and my experience, we've lost very close loved ones that we know we could have helped or have helped or had helped. Right. Yeah. And we'd want to keep that. We want to continue that. Yeah, definitely. So once we see the warning signs, Tony, this is where you, this is where I think you really added to a lot of things. Cause I don't know how to talk about it. So okay. what do I do, man? What if you see the, the warning signs? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do I do? Don't, don't be judgmental. Um, try to be sympathetic and listen and, and, and don't just listen, but listen effectively. Um, it's a different kind of listening than when we're just having a chat with our mates, you know, um, it's just really listening and trying to pick up on, on, on maybe body uh, cues or pitch in voice. Um, I, I think everyone should have listening training or effective listening training. Um, it really helps in, in, in all kinds of different situations, but it's also really important to take the person seriously and not to minimize, uh, what it is that they're saying. Um, I shared with you a, a while ago uh, when I was going through something, um, reaching out, I reached out to a friend um, and her response was, oh, do you know what, Tony, I've got too much going on in my life at the moment. I can't deal with your shit or, or words to that effect. And, you know, I wasn't taken seriously. But also what that did for me was it it fed into this feeling of being a burden. Um so yeah, that didn't do me that that didn't do me very good at, at the time. But it's really important to take take the person serious, uh, take the person seriously, and to ask them direct questions. Ask them, are you thinking about committing suicide? Um, there's also like a level of uh, suicide risk. So by asking certain questions or uh, direct, direct questions about suicide, you can kind of gauge where they are on that level. If someone's okay. uh, if someone's at a low level, they might just have fleeting suicidal thoughts they've definitely got no plan uh, is that they... like a scale or is it just a general kind of idea yeah it's kind of like we're, we taught this during uh suicide prevention training or, or suicide training um so i guess it's a general scale um so yeah so low would be that they wouldn't have a suicide plan and, and that they're not actually going to attempt to do it or thinking about attempting to do it they've just got some maybe some low level ideation uh, moderate would be that they do have some suicidal thoughts and a vague plan. Uh, high would be that they do have a specific plan. Uh, they do have suicidal thoughts, um, but they're not actually saying when they're going to commit suicide or that they actually will do it. But you want to watch out for severe. Uh, that's when they've got their suicidal thoughts. They've got a specific plan. They know how they're going to do it. They've made arrangements and uh, perhaps they've even got a date or or, or a time of when they're going to do it. Okay. Also, it's important that it's not just about us uh, talking to, to people and trying to talk them out of it. It's following, it's following that process up. So it could be helping someone to arrange professional help and maybe going along with them, uh, you know, for these sessions, or maybe it's a telephone call, whatever, uh, just being there for that person. It's really important that someone who is feeling so empty and so, so on their own, and so wrapped up in their, um, I don't want to sound negative, but so wrapped up in this, in themselves, they can't help that. It's really important that they have someone with them uh, for, for that journey because it could just get them out of it. Yeah. So 
have you obviously you've been instrumental in approaching others with that would you say have you ever approached a complete stranger or or have they all been somebody that you've known that you noticed um the, the majority of them have been during during my professional career uh so when i was working in uh in the crisis service yeah in effect they were strangers because uh, the crisis service would be some someone uh, perhaps has been admitted to hospital because they've tried to commit suicide or or they're at crisis point and then they come out of hospital and they go to the service for a short period of time it could be anything between three and two weeks three days and two weeks so as soon as you meet that person you're sitting down you're assessing that person you're talking to them um about their crisis so yeah i guess they are strangers uh, yeah. but, but I guess it's easier in that setting because there's a process, you know, and it's not just you, you've got your work colleagues to, to also give some input as well. Right now, these people have been, have come to the, to your location. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Or were assigned in some way. So I'm wondering like out in, out in the world, you're, you're noticing someone who's kind of in the corner or something. I mean, how, how bold have you been to, to walk up to, to a complete stranger and say, Hey, you okay? Everything all right? I've never done that. I've never, never done that. Yeah. I feel like that's the one, those are the ones that are really helpful if, if we have the guts to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause that the, obviously we, it, it's hard to talk with friends, but it's way easier with friends. And like, you're going to talk to a complete, someone you've never walked up to and go, Hey, are you all right? I noticed you're not feeling great or I yeah, but also, something. But also at the same time, I think when you do, I think it's easier to talk to a stranger about these kind of emotional issues than it is to a friend. So, yeah, I think you, it's yeah. easier to talk, but I just don't know that initial, right? The the yeah, first exactly. contact, I guess, in a way. Yeah. But you're and right. That, it is because it is anonymous then almost, right? Yeah. And now I'm thinking about uh, all, all these times that I've seen maybe someone sitting on a on a bench by, by the beach on their own. And I could have gone up to them and just said, you're right. But yeah, I didn't. Yeah. It's weird. Cause I start playing those through my head too. Mm. You know, um, I, I'll, I'll share some of the stuff on that. You know, we talked about having that second kind of episode that we'll do. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, it, but it's vitally important. You have to talk to them. Just, Definitely. just say, Hey man, are you okay? Yeah. Um, and, I know a lot of people, everybody's a little different, but if, if there's someone, you know, you might know, you might have the correct sensibility to, of a way to talk with them mm. and to connect with them. Use that, that friendship, use that familiarity with them as, as your tool to yeah. help connect. Yeah. yeah. And just let them talk, you know, and uh, they they probably say something that you don't agree with, but don't, you know, don't judge them. Uh, try not to act shot or lecture them on, you know, and definitely don't say anything like oh, pull, uh, pull your socks up or you know just snap yeah, out of it just do yeah. it already that's always a good one <sighs> yeah Ooh, i've seen it but you know i mean and that's the thing is i think another thing we can help with this is we're on the other side of it right to your point your friend's point uh she's like i don't have time for this shit yeah words to that effect right I have since I've, spoken to her ab about it, and and um, yeah, she she did apologize, but she was going through an extraordinary amount of shit herself at the time. I, I can only imagine, and and I absolutely get that. At the same point, though, we all should know that we're going to be in that same place that that person is now, and yeah. how much we could use someone when we're going to be in that place. Yes, good point. But also, but also, <laughs> we shouldn't be driven to do something just because we might be faced with that in the future. We should be driven to help people because we want to help people. Not yes, I, I just yeah. meant a general compassion, oh, not yeah. in a yeah. not in a pe robbing Peter pay Paul kind of like okay. you owe me. Yeah. It's not an you owe me thing. It's more of a well, all of us are. Go Let's put it yeah in a broader sense. All of us are going to be struggling at some point in our life. It's good to help each other when we go through yeah. it. Yeah, because we'll eventually be there at some point. Yeah, kind of. I, I mean, I guess it's more of a compassion. I'm trying to come at from a compassionate sense, but mm. I'm an American, Tony. We do things totally different. <laughs> we noticed that, and we're going to talk about that. You've got guns. Um, is <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm gonna. Like I said, I'm very open to talk about it, but it's I'm I'm weird about that one. I don't know. Um. Anyway, 
Back are to there the, any, are there any the tips that, that that you can think of? You know, I to your point, you just have to say, "I'm concerned about you." I yes. that's what I say, and the, the I think this plays into a little bit of alcohol and and or um, suicide and and. Uh, Addictions kind of play a little hand in glove, right? Yeah. So, like mental problems you hide with drugs or alcohol or food, and then that makes it worse. So your mental will get worse, right? And then it spirals, right? Okay. Um, I think I think we have to be very careful of that, be very aware of that. But when we see something, you know, it, it's best to pull them aside and say, uh, man, I'm I'm a little concerned about, you know, are you, is everything okay? Hmm. I, but it's ta- it's hard and you and I've talked about it what about you've met somebody who, who you've done it before and you, you've run out of tools in your toolbox you know the fifth sixth time you're talking to the person what do you use you know how, how much more how many more resources can you get I guess you just try to in the moment research and 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 just find other other utilities in your tool, toolbox to help. And uh, actually another thing that really helps as well is this idea that whatever someone is going through is transient. It's not always going to be like this because when you are in that moment, possibly one of the reasons why, because uh, there's, there's, there's always more than one reason why someone wants to kill themselves. So possibly one of the reasons could be that they just don't want the pain to carry on or they can't see that their future is going to get any better. But to let them know that what you're going through is transient. It won't always be like this. This is a moment in time. Uh, That's really valuable. Um, I've I've definitely found that professionally and, and personally to be a quite a valuable bit of the toolkit. That is an excellent point. Um, And the other thing too, uh, like we had talked about, made the disclaimer, Hey, if you're feeling like this could trigger you, don't listen to this alone. Listen to it with a friend who cares about you. There are some amazing documentaries. I saw one, The Choice to Live, I think I shared with you. It's about people who attempted suicide and and went through and found this new lease on life out of it, right? right? Yeah. They realized, oh, crap, I didn't want to do this. And now they have a whole new lease on life to to really live their best life. Hmm. So it's it's interesting seeing the viewpoint of people who have survived attempts. And, and often a lot of people that survive, you know, re- really serious attempts go on to help other people. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Th- through that. Absolutely. 100%. Um, if, if, okay. So we've kind of covered that. I think the last part that we should probably cover is like, if you're feeling a little off, what, what do you do if it's you and you're, you're listening to this and you're going, Hey, I kind of resemble some of that. Would you, you have any advice for anybody who's kind of feeling this way? What would be the first thing to do or, or a couple of steps to take? The, the first thing to do, <clears throat> sorry, the first thing to do would be to talk to someone, <clears throat> talk to someone that you feel uh, comfortable in talking to. It could be a, <clears throat> a family member or a friend, or it could be, I mean, here in the UK, I'm sure you have a similar service in the US. In the UK, we have a service called the Samaritans. Uh, so you can phone them 24 hours a day. It's a free phone call. And they're qualified, they're trained uh, to talk people through any kind of uh, suicidal ideation uh, or depression, any kind of crisis that they're going through. Um, They're a really valuable and important resource. Uh, Do you have something similar in the US? I'd imagine you would. Yes, we do. I think we have what's like a suicide hotline of some sort. And I think there was actually a pop song written maybe two years ago, three years ago. It's like 1-800-something. Okay. That's the actual number to the suicide hotline. Oh, wow. So if there's a pop song, it start, it's like 1-800 and then the number. That's actually in regards to suicide. And then we obviously had a couple brushes with, with artists, right? We had uh, Chris Cornell followed by the guy from Linkin Park, right? Chester mm-hmm. Bedingfield. Yeah. And they had a close relationship. So it's very interesting how, how his, the one taking his life – I don't know if that re-triggered the other guy's evaluation on his own, you know? Right, possibly. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, the one thing for, for me, to your point, the first thing to do, if you feel anything like 
if you resemble any of this, talk to your closest person that you know, or the one that, to your point, that you trust the most. If you don't feel like you have that, get professional help. Yeah. Get professional. It saved my life. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, I, I'm with my story. I was, you know, I, like I said, I was going to eat myself to death, but I'm not going to lie. It did to start increasing in, in my early, uh, right at 39, 40, you know, those thoughts started getting more and more. Hmm. Um, and I felt to the point where I needed to just talk to somebody and I'd never talked to a psychologist, psychiatrist, anybody. I went and I saw a gentleman, uh, who's an NLP, which is neuro linguistic programmer. Yeah. Are you familiar with that very. philosophy or that yeah, very. discipline? Um, so they go through your subconscious, like semi hypnosis ish kind of just meditation y kind of stuff. Um, I walked into his office the first time he looked at me and he said, he cocked his head, he said, You're different. Wow. And I lost it. And uh he saved my life. And you lost it because somebody got you. Yeah. Or someone connected on that level. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And he, well, the thing was, the thing is, in my head, I'm sure that's what I thought, because he's such a professional. He realized that that's what I was missing in my head. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, definitely. He he knew what to say. Yeah. Doesn't mean I felt like I was right. Like no one got me. I'm sure people got me. I might not have felt that way, right? But mm -hmm. he knew the exact thing to say to get me to literally like I like snapped back to reality for a second. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I work with him and, um, I never did, I never did, uh, any kind of pills or supplement. Um, but I, and it wasn't until after that, like I never was into anything. Food was my only drug. <laughs> it was crazy. But, uh, I, it's, what's interesting is you, we talk about, I was 297 pounds and all I needed to do was address my, I was probably 250, 260 when I met him, 270. But all I needed to do was address my emotional side yeah. and my weight literally melted off because it was no longer my crutch. Wow. And how directly those were connected, it's unbelievable. I'm now sitting about 215. So I'm still like a bigger dude, but I've always been like a thicker kid. So, hmm. um, but, so when you when you say that the weight just melted off, were you doing anything like because your emotional state had changed? Were you more motivated, or were you doing more exercise? Were you looking at what you were eating? Yeah, what's funny about it? It it I had such an emotional calm that any time any stress where I would have reached for food, I didn't. Wow. But it wasn't. Con it's so not conscious, if that makes sense. Like I wasn't. I, it's my opinion that diets fail because all you think about is the diet. Hmm. So when all you think about is the diet and food, guess what you're going to gravitate towards, right? Yeah. When I address my emotional stuff, the food became unnecessary. Hmm. Um, so, so were you I able to address? Were you able to address your emotional side yourself, or was that through the help of? No, that was through the help. Yeah, I needed a lot of help with that. Okay. Um, but we also talked about some of the other things that I experienced during that. And that really changed my whole path in life. Wow. Uh, so it had a I'm a weirdo, profound, man. No, it had, that's uh, a real profound change. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and if, if I, and it sucks because you don't always feel like you have the choice when you're in that state. Yeah. But if you took it, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be helped. If you take the first step, just the littlest first step, you will get the help you need, I think, most yeah. in most cases. Yeah. So. And it's, so for, for our point of view and trying to help someone, it's trying to elicit that first step, isn't it? Or, it is. Or even just being kind of like an ambassador for that first step. So by, by showing someone that, you know, there is someone that's there and there's someone that's listening and taking them seriously, that might then carry them further up the steps of getting professional help. I've used, I've used this before. I've, I know someone who was very close on the edge and I said, I know it's your life and you have every choice, but you're going to be missed and loved. You're, mm. you're loved here by me, at least me. I know there's at least, I could give you a handful of people. You will be missed if you're gone. That's, 
I because that the isolation is the one that I think is the real bad one. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's an interesting uh, experiment mm-hmm. where, and it it's a little bit more to do with drugs or dependency, but it does fall in the hands of this. Is have you ever heard like the rat colony where they took like twenty rats? And they had them all isolated into individual boxes, and they had a, like a rat community where they could all intermingle. I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> so I'll I'll send a TED talk. Maybe I'll put it on there. But basically, what it was was they had like a rat community, Ratville, and they had two types of water. One was regular water, and one was laced with like a drug. And in the community, in the rat community, one, the majority drank the regular water, and every once in a while went to the other one. But in the one that they were all isolated, they almost systematically hit the one with the with the drug in it. Wow. And it's just, you know, it's just a social thing, right? Yeah. We are social. I mean, the whole point of the tribalism is out of the social hierarchy, right? Yeah. We need that connection. And I, the first thing I tell somebody is, if you're gone, I'll miss you. Yeah. And it it can be a stranger because I miss, I feel humanity, man. I feel the world, you know? So have you been in situations where you have approached a stranger then and had that conversation with them? Yes. Okay. Um, and on that point, do, do we have every, because that's the story of Jay that oh, I'll okay. share okay. on the next, uh, what we'll do is we're just going to take a quick pause, obviously, and then we'll, you and I'll come back, but, uh, are, is there anything else about this part of it that we'd like to talk about before we share our stories? Um, I'd, yeah, I'd like to read the, the two emails. Um, Please. One, one of them does have qu- quite a few tips, uh, and it's from someone it. who's been in mental health for quite a long time. They're quite long, so, so bear with me. Uh, so, not, not a problem at all. I am muting my microphone. Okay. So this is from uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a good friend, uh, and he's worked in mental health for 11 years. Uh, and Daniel works in in my team, actually. So Daniel says that he's worked within mental health for 11 years and uh, suicidal thoughts and ideations and attempts on life. Um, He's come across quite a few of those during the years, uh, and they've been primarily linked with mental health conditions such as depression. Uh, Many people with depression can turn to self-coping mechanisms, like Mark mentioned, um, an example of which can be alcohol consumption, uh, which can then fuel the depression, and that can then increase the suicidal thoughts. Men find it really difficult to talk about their feelings and thoughts and how this could negatively impact their mental health. But why is it that men won't talk to their friends? Surely this is the biggest question to be looking at with the number of men, and young men especially, who lose their lives to suicide each day. Dan says, is it pressure on men to provide for the family or is it a fear of being viewed as a failure? Uh, Dan goes on to say that women are are more open to talking about emotions and feelings and maybe men are finding it hard to start that initial conversation because they fear that they could be judged. In Dan's professional experience, uh, he's found that women tend to have more suicidal thoughts and they voice them, but the death rates are higher in men because they don't voice them or talk. Uh, Dan says that he once worked with an outreach client who always vocalised about wanting to end their life. Uh, But she said that the one and only thing that always stopped her was thinking about her children and not wanting to leave them behind. Uh, And often a parental or family member suicide uh, can lead to increased risk of suicide within the family down the generations. Uh, A larger percentage of men who commit suicide don't actually have dependents. uh, So maybe that's... (laughs) that's a reason not to live. Uh, And often the life and soul of the party can be excellent at hiding how they feel and present as having the perfect life. They're always joking and laughing, but actually what they're doing is they're using that to distract and disguise how they're feeling. Uh, Some reasons that Dan has come across for these suicidal thoughts through depression could be things like losing employment, not being able to provide for loved ones, feeling inferior to friends or loved ones and not making the grade or not feeling part of the group or viewing yourself as not making the grade in comparison to friends, family or colleagues. Dan says that his dad and his granddad were raised to believe that showing emotion is a weakness and uh, traditionally it meant that weakness wasn't an option as a man. Uh, Given the right 
<clears throat> excuse me, given the right environment and space, men will talk about their struggles, pain, concerns and feelings. There is a solution to every problem and men need to look after their mental health to talk it through and see a light at the end of the tunnel. But they might not be able to do this alone and they shouldn't need to feel that they're doing it on their own. Three quarters of suicide by men in the UK. Uh, I think what Dan's trying to say is that three quarters of uh, the suicide rates in the UK are by men uh, and the thoughts of being a burden and loved ones being better off are the highest factors and men's repetitive thoughts leading to this tunnel vision thinking can be a factor. Men often feel that they need to be the tower of strength. Maybe your own thoughts continuously going around in your head leads to wanting peace to end it all. It's imperative to get these thoughts out of your head. If you can't talk to friends or family, talk to a stranger, talk to your dog, just sometimes just talking and vocalizing your thoughts and hearing them out loud can help. So what more can we do to change this? What can you do to change this? Well, asking someone how they are can be the quickest conversation of our days, but revisit this. Asking your friends, are you really okay? And, and letting them know that you are that person that they can tell stuff to. Just let them know that it's me and, and I'm here. Families, loved ones and friends take on the pain when someone takes their own life. And the pain for that person may be over, but taking, but talking and seeking help uh, for that pain can leave before uh, taking that path. Could mental health on school curriculums be the answer? Uh, possibly uh, let's encourage care and compassion from an early age and encourage talking and inform young people about depression and mental health issues. It's no longer a taboo topic. And Dan ends with ask a friend today, how are you doing? Are you really okay? So that kind of uh, carries on with what we were talking about, Mark, about it's not just asking if someone's okay. It's about carrying on that conversation. Um, yeah, the follow up, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you say you're okay, but are you? Why? Yeah. How? How? Okay, how aren't you okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, continue, please. Was was there anything in there? <clears throat> was there anything that, in there that jumped out that maybe we haven't covered? Uh, absolutely. I think the overall he. I think it was a great summary of kind of everything we discussed, right? Mm. Uh, getting help and asking. Uh, it sound who is it? Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, he's, you said he's been in this for about 10, 12 years? Uh, 11 years. 11 years. That's right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Daniel, for sharing that. Uh, do you have anything to add to that portion before you share the other email? Uh, just just to thank Daniel for that. I th thought that was really insightful and hopefully... Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so this is from uh, another dear friend. This is from Jess. Uh, Jess says that suicide has uh, uh, touched her life in a number of ways. Um, and she thinks that this is a subject of conversation which is much needed at the moment. Oh, um, So Jess has been touched by suicide in a number of ways. Her aunt and her two friends ended their lives and uh, Jess herself has made pretty violent attempts in the past to do the same. Um, Jess says that I think to consider suicide and to reach the crossroads where that is considered an option is clearly tragic. However, there is help to those struggling with finding a handle on emotions. And Jess has been fortunate enough to find professionals with whom she could talk freely, openly and honestly with without the fear of being told what to do or any kind of judgment um, or even just judging about suicide plans. And I think for someone just coming off from, from what Jess has written, I think for... For mental health professionals, I guess it's easier to talk to someone with suicidal ideations or talk about suicide plans without being shocked. But if you haven't had that kind of training and you're talking to a friend and they're talking to you about their plans, that can be really shocking. Uh, but it's you can't approach it from any level of like shock. Uh, or, or judgment. Anyway, so just going back to Jess, Jess says this sensitive and empathetic response is key to providing a safe space to talk. And in doing so, it paves the way for a level of self self acceptance. And it, it help, helps with the time to slow down thoughts, enabling more reflection and hopefully inner peace. Uh, I think people who are carers, friends, family of someone in the midst of suicidal feelings often feel a sense of paralysis in what to do. As someone who is frantic for someone to sit down and have a couple with, it's often the low key engagement with another human being that can make a massive difference. For me, finding a friend to share an enthusiasm for gardening was a great source of strength. Finding this common ground made me feel immediately more relaxed and in my own time gave me a stronger command of my feelings and of accepting them in their full human range. 
I think to feel accepted in suicidal feelings is absolutely key, both your own self-acceptance and the wider acceptance of others close to you or part of your community. As someone who has lost people to suicide, I think it's important to allow your feelings to be felt fully and not punish yourself with a time frame for grief. It's also possible to feel a surge of anger and rage and also to elevate them as a hero or a flawless person. There are, of course, going to be substantial unanswered questions, and I think the not knowing and never knowing is one of the hardest aspects. There is the possibility of reliving and your memories being dr drastically different to the decision that the person made to commit the suicide. For example, he was always the life and soul of the party and you're left with disbelief as to how he could do this. But this is an enormous challenge for family and friends and for anyone going through this. I can only say I feel your pain and grief and that all your feelings count. Thank you very much, Jess. Thank you, Jess. Uh, something did certainly stick out and you touched on as well is, is uh, when you speak with someone, measured response, non-emotional. Yeah. Uh, because that can exacerbate their emotional state. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jess, for sharing that. So that was a beautiful thing. And to the point of gardening too, it also gives you something to do. Like it does become probably an, uh, a healthy distraction. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, anything like that, anything that that can be a distraction. It's about getting yourself out of your inner mind and dealing with external stuff. Because yeah, and, and especially if we feel that we're not contributing or we're a burden. Yeah. Well, what's better than doing something that contributes? Exactly. Finding you know, being productive, like gardening, is is a you're grow you're creating at that point, which is a beautiful thing. Thanks for letting me share those, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for doing this with me, Tony. Uh, we're going to actually cut it here and then we're going to have our second part of this, which is going to be, we're going to share some stories on the next Not Conscious. It'll be a week after we release this one. So uh, do you have any closing thoughts or anything, Tony? Um, just for people. Before we do the stories. <laughs> <laughs> just for people to be kinder to each other. Uh, be kinder to yourself. Be kinder to other people. Look out for people. If you if you feel, if you get an impression that someone is struggling, just take time out to speak to them. A Amen. And if you feel the slightest bit of any of what we discussed, I it's let me, I'll put it this way. It's easier to, to, to fix a car problem when, at, when it first happens and when you let it create problems elsewhere. So if you feel the littlest touch of just even disappointment or sadness, feel free to express it with your closest friend right away. You know, just, we should be able to discuss every state that we feel without it being judged. Um, but it's, it's a tough world sometimes, right? It is, uh, did, Mark. Do you have a you have a, an email for uh, an email account for Not Conscious? Yeah, I do. Uh, feel free. So I will sh I'll share it with everyone. It's okay. info at knockedconscious dot com, or if you want Gmail, my Gmails I don't check much, but it's knockedconsciouspodcast at gmail dot com. Excellent. So if, uh, maybe if anyone wants to reach out for any further resources uh, that we could, yes, in. yeah. I was going to actually offer my Twitter uh, because I am on there daily. Uh, that's how you and I actually primarily communicate, which is great. Um, I'm at Knocked Con, K N O C K E D C O N. If you feel alone and you don't feel like you can talk to anyone, I can't promise I'll respond the second you send a message because I don't know. But if I see it, I will respond. That's fantastic. I'm here. Look, I love the world and I might be a curmudgeon -y, grumpy dude, but the humanity is a really dichotomous thing. But the beauty side of it is so beautiful. Yeah. So and one more thing, like I, I watched in, in talking about this and researching this, I, I, I looked at a lot of philosophers uh, viewpoints on suicide and regardless of how they felt about why or why not. They all tend to lean towards choosing life. Oh. And I mean choosing life, not mm. choosing death. I mean choosing it, not having it happen to them. Right. So it's interesting. Uh, that one, I'll share that one article as well that, that spoke about that. Excellent. Tony. Good, good chat, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for bringing, bringing this up. Once again, this has been another Not Conscious. We did talk about suicide. Next week, it's going to be the second half of this this podcast is going to be 
uh, Tony and my personal stories with some 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 just really touchy things. So we're going to be having some waterworks, I think. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Tony, again. Thank That's you, fun. Jess and Daniel, for sharing your emails. Uh, and any final words, Tony? Just take care, everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>